One is a top cop in a fight against gangs, the other a young man in a fight to get out. Together they form both sides of BC's ongoing struggle to put a stop to gang violence. And tonight we take you inside their world for part two of Gang Wars. February 3rd, and 21-year-old Rafael Baldini is gunned down in his SUV in a crowded mall parking lot. Three days later, another brazen shooting, again in the middle of the afternoon, again in front of a crowded shopping mall. This time, 26-year-old Kevin LeClaire is killed. Both men had gang ties. The killings only continue from there, police rushing out at all hours of the day for shootings and stabbings, most often gang-related. It's become a daily routine and a constant headline in Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver is embroiled in an explosion of gun violence that rivals almost anything anywhere in North America. It's now 646, six shootings in the past six days on the Lower Mainland. Multiple murders, gangland slayings, and last night, a man shot dead in the parking lot of a mall. Perhaps the most shocking of all, the murder of 23-year-old Nicole Alamy on February 16th, shot behind the wheel of her husband's car at a suburban intersection with her four-year-old son in the back seat. Again, police say the shooting had all the hallmarks of a gang hit. It was here on a Monday by this intersection around 10.30. Yes, it was during the day, that's correct. 23-year-old woman in a car and a four-year-old in the back seat. Yes. To me, it doesn't get more disturbing than that. Well, it's uh, very disturbing for us. I mean, the, when you look at um, that gang activities and uh, people involved in this kind of lifestyle, I mean, they, they really don't care anymore uh, when it comes to uh, who else that uh, could get hurt from this. Superintendent Dan Mallow leads BC's Integrated Gang Task Force. He says the gang war in BC is unprecedented, but the underlying principles are the same as in any gang war. Drugs, money, and power. What we find in BC right now is it's a big shift of the market. So when you shift the market and you have too many gangs for the amount of users, drug users, they have to go and forcibly take over somebody else's drug line. And that's really what this is all about. 129 gangs are now fighting for turf in British Columbia, running drug lines for cocaine, marijuana, and ecstasy. It's not the numbers that, uh, that, that really show a good picture. It's the amount of gangs that um, have decided that it's okay at four o'clock in the afternoon in a mall parking lot uh, to use high-powered weapons and shoot somebody. That's, so it's not the numbers, it's the level of violence that the gangs are actually not afraid of doing right now. Uh, that's the concern. The proof is in how gangs are now equipped. Armored cars, military-grade ammunition, and the new staple, worn like it's just another piece of clothing, bulletproof vests. So where is it going to stop? Somebody wears this bulletproof vest, another gang gets a bullet that can penetrate this, another gang gets an armored vehicle that bullets can't penetrate either. Where does it stop? Well, we've got to make this illegal. We've got to make armored vehicles illegal, and we've got to throw people that think it's okay to kill other human beings in jail. 25-year-old Devin is no stranger to jail. He's been in and out more times than he can count. Stolen cars, assault, uh, robbery, armed robbery, possessing a weapon, everything under the book, almost. And for 12 years, a gang was the only place he felt like he belonged. I was in foster home to group home to foster home to group. I've been in, what, 57 group homes and foster homes, and I just kept running away. I, after a while, when I turned 13, I just started not caring. I hung out with a different crowd and went the wrong direction. One of the members said, you can stay at my place. I started staying at the place. Here's some dope, go sell this. Okay, I sold the dope. Oh, this guy, this guy screwed around, go smash him out. Smash him out, come back. Did you ever say no? Did you think to say, yeah, I don't want to smash this guy up? Absolutely not. Why not? I was afraid what could happen to me if I said no. And you know what? I've seen people's fingers get chopped off. I've seen pe people tortured in a chair, strapped to a chair. He was shot in the leg, his brother was kidnapped, and Devin finally decided six months ago it was time to leave. He turned to a group called Real World Truth, run by Amir Javid. 
All I have to do is prove to a kid, hey, you know what? Your involvement equals death. The kid gets it. But how do you get him out? How do you take the fear of, uh, of leaving? How do you take the fear of him being able to fit into society away from him? And that's what we do through the program. It's a similar point to the one Superintendent Mallow was trying to drive home. We've got to reinstill fear, not just fear to the police, but if you commit a criminal act and you're doing damage to the community, the community is going to deal with you. And they deal with you through the court system in Canada. So we've got to be able to bring that back somehow and modernize that system. But jail is not something most gang members are afraid of. You go to North Fraser, you can sit there and play PlayStation 2 in your room. You got full, you got every single channel for television, you know, like. So jail isn't scary. It's a daycare. The only thing that scares Devin is that one day his past will catch up with him. I made an agreement when I got jumped in. You were jumped in? Yeah. And what was that agreement? That I can't leave. Just like most gangs, once you're in, you're in. And if you try and leave, you just get killed or murdered. The irony is that although Devin and Superintendent Mallow have always stood on opposite sides of the police tape, they're now fighting for the same thing. And it's a fight that's only just beginning. We're going to win this, but it's going to take us some time.